Let's unhook, take one. Um, let's start out by talking a little bit way before you get here to Richmond and start working in the shipyards and your life changed. I'd, I'd like you to give me a sense of what it was like living in Arkansas on a farm during the Depression. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, it was quite rough and uh, a way of life of doing without a lots of needs. I never forget. Uh, Mr. Hatt, uh, let, let me just mention one thing before we cut for a second. Take two. Okay, look, tell me, give me a sense of what it was like living on a farm in Arkansas in the middle of the Depression. Yeah. Well, it was uh, quite a way of suffering and, uh, as I said, doing without a lot of needing the things that you need. I never forget, I uh, grew up on the farm out. My daddy, he was a farmer. And uh, so my first job after leaving him on the farm was uh, on the railroad. I left home and got a job on the railroad and worked. That was what I would, was doing. Did you get a sense uh, back there in, say, 1935, 36, that things were just going to keep on being bad? Did you think things would get better? Well, I, uh, what I can remember about that was that I thought there was, I didn't think it was going to get better there. and. Uh, I remember starting to try to choose and find a place, some other place to go and live. And I never forget, I uh, could hear of a lot of railroad construction in uh, Mississippi. And I was planning to go there. And, uh, before I got ready and got myself planned to leave, I heard of uh, work in California. There was two fellows I grew up with that had left and come here. One was named Robert Taylor. He was my children's mother's uncle. And the other one was Henry Bayless. He was their mother's sister's husband. So did they come back and tell you or write no, to you? No, they, they, just, they just wrote back home and uh, the people would talk it, what they were doing, how much money they was making. So then I made up my mind to come here. Did it, did it sound like California might be better than what you were going through? Yeah. Yes, it did. No. So, uh, I remember you were telling me before that uh, that your father wasn't real enthusiastic about you leaving. No, he wasn't. That's something I never forget. And growing up, I was the youngest of four sons, and I used to be obedient to him. And he was used to. And then after I grew up and got married, I still looked to him to advise me, go to him, and. So I had went there and told him that I planned to leave and come to California. And uh, I had my time set maybe a couple of three weeks. So and uh, I had to borrow my fare. So I didn't borrow it from him. I had been getting a little money from him, but this was going to be uh, Fifty dollars is what I needed, and there was a man that run the gin uptown there that I usually would go and get five or six dollars from him. So I went to him. His name was Will Munn. He's a tall, kind of senior fellow. He was. I never forget the day I went there and told him that I wanted to buy. Fifty dollars. 
I heard that they had jobs in California, and I was, and he let me have that money. I just think every now and say it was just the Lord's blessings. He pulled it out of his pocket and counted it out to me. And uh, then I caught a bus. Tell me a little bit about the trip out, out yeah. to California. Yeah, well, now the trip, the bus was crowded, mixed with both all races, and uh, there was uh, women and men, and not no cheering, I don't remember. So we Hang just... Hang Let, let's stop for a second. We, we got... Take three. Um, before you tell me about, about what it was like coming out here on that crowded bus, tell me what you thought about before you left in terms of what, what you hoped California would be like. Yes, uh... <clears throat> one thing that I was real concerned and interested about was what they was making per hour and day. And uh, as I was just saying when I borrowed this money, my fare from this gin man, he uh, said something that I didn't never understand until after I got here. And he told me, he says, when he let me have the money, he says, uh, uh, going to California. So he run his hand in his pocket and pulled it out and gave it to me. He said, now don't go out there and get your head knocked off. So <laughs> I didn't know exactly what he meant, but thinking about it later, he had heard about the racial difference there and back there. And on my way here on the bus, it was crowded. And uh, I never will forget, there was a white lady sitting right next to me. And uh, just above me was some young black fellas. And one of them, when we got over the line into California, well, the first bus stop, and she, the bus drivers called the name of the place, California. And one of these guys sitting there, well, we're in California now. You all can, you guys, you all can forget about being pushed around with these folks now, because they don't do it out here. <laughs> he did a lot of talk. Yeah, that just saying yes sir, no, sir. I never will forget that. I said, well, I shown up when I got here, well, I found out what he meant. He had been here before. It was more friendly and so uh, I didn't see there was, there wasn't too much fighting and going on, but uh, of uh, racial, but there was one fight I never forget about. It was my brother that was there when this happened. It was on the ship, and you know, there was stages, about four different stages going up and working on the ship. And, and this uh, white, I don't know whether he was a shipwright, I think, he had dropped his heavy wrench and it fell down the side of a black guy down on the next stage. And this guy, he was just overbearing, cussed and raised, saying, that ranch had to hit me, I'd climb up there and invade you. Cussed him, you know, and if you don't like it, come on down. Said, right guy. Well, I ain't had a fight in a long time, but I'm coming down. <laughs> <laughs> come down there, and they hooked up fist and that. So after they, some of the, one of the black guys said, well, let's stop them. They run in and grabbed them, pulled them apart. And, Stopped them. So after the thing was quieting down, some of them asked this guy, the man said, now, that was some fist and skull. Who, who, who won it? Said, I don't know who won it. All I know, I don't want to fight with so and so no more. <laughs> but, but the, you know, these incidents stick out, but what was it like working? I mean, 
the shipyards really brought white people and black people together in ways that yeah. they never had been working right. together. What, what right. was that like? Oh, it was just wonderful and peaceful. There wasn't no trouble at all. It was, uh, you know, I was just so surprised and glad of the way, you know, things. From Coming from Arkansas, had you expected something else, maybe? Well, I would, you know, was ex yeah, I wasn't expecting no trouble, but I wasn't expecting to find it as peaceful as it was. Can we wait for the plane? Yeah, okay, let's stop for a second. How are we on this magazine? Take four. <coughs> Excuse me. Mr. Van Hook, tell me, tell me a little bit about how it worked once, once you got to California on this bus. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember how it worked, what happened that first day when you went down to get your job? Yes, I remember <clears throat> what uh, a crowd it was. I was uh, in Berkeley, and uh, I had been directed how to catch the streetcar to go to the shipyard. So I rode the streetcar to could we start again? And try not to look at the camera, okay? Just, just look okay, at me. Okay. Okay. T tell me about right. Okay, you rode the streetcar to yeah. down there. And what do you see when you get there? Is there a lot of people there? A lot of people. I mean, there was a lot of people. It'd be a long line getting on the streetcar, <clears throat> and then uh, when we got to the shipyard, it was a long line being hired, but they was hiring people just like that in a long line. And uh, all I knew was I wanted a job in the shipyard. And I remember when I <coughs> finally got up to the little window where the lady was, a young white lady, <coughs> and uh, she asked me, what yard do you want to go to? So I didn't know what to tell her. I paused there and she says, yard three? I said, well, it'll be all right. So she wrote me up for yard three. That was the best one. And uh, I went on to yard three and there was a long line there. And so when I got up to where she she wanted to know what I wanted to do. I couldn't tell her, and she says, well, she says, uh, you'd be a barler maker, you, you'd be a driller. I told her, all right, she wrote me up as a driller, and that was the first job I had when I went in there. What was that job like? Tell me what the work of it was. Yeah, what the, it was uh, drilling holes for the bolting, you know. And the uh, driller and the chipper did about the same work. You, you're drilling, you're running an air drill and uh, drilling holes for bolts. And the chipping was, you know, had that chipping gun that cut steel. You did both of them. So after I worked, I don't remember how long I was working. And uh, they uh, promoted me for a lead man in charge of the crew. So I said, thanks about it, and working hard and being honest and being timely, you know. That's what did that. Now, when you're a lead man, um, your crew had a lot of different people on it, right? Yeah, White yeah. folks and black folks. Yeah, yeah. All kinds. How, how did they feel about someone like you being in charge of them? Well, they didn't, uh, they, they, they didn't act no ways uh, contrary at all. They would carry on just fine. I didn't have no problem like that. Do you think, um, do you think one of the reasons that people got along so well in the shipyard was that this, this sense of patriotism that everybody wanted to help win the war? Do you think I, that was part I, of it? I think I'm, I'm, I believe it was. 
I mean, it's yeah. hard for people to understand now how that how strong that feeling was. Yeah. Yeah, the the too one too much trouble in like there no racial problems. I don't remember any. How how did it seem to you once you had been on the job um, working there as opposed to what you remembered about life on the farm? Yeah, that was so different. I uh, I had never had. <coughs> like a hundred dollars cash in my hand, you know, that I'd earned. And uh, so I remember so well that after I worked, I don't know how long I worked, a few months, and then made a trip back home. And me and my wife planned then when I come back, <coughs> go to work and then send for them, she's going to come bring the children. So that's what I did. I went back and went to work, and then a few days I sent her fare, and she come and brought the children. <coughs> and uh, so I carried her and another lady to the job, to the shipyard, and they went right on in, went to work as welders. And me and her both was working on the same shift and everything. And uh, that's when we cash our checks up there on 23rd. And <clears throat> we'd have, uh, it wasn't $200, but it was, it was over 100 put in our pocket. That was a blessing. So we saved money like that. But you got to buy things for the first time too, right? At which? You could go out and actually buy things in stores too, right? Oh yeah, sure. What kinds of things would you get? Well, uh, you know, I used to remember what was the first things we uh, bought. We bought some furniture, all right, and uh, bought some nice clothing. And that was <clears throat> quite a thrill to have a bank account. Something I hadn't had, you know. People of... Uh People, yes, I'm sorry. Can we talk? You want to stop for a second? Okay. Yeah. Day five. C <laughs> could you speak a little louder too when we talk? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested to know what Richmond was like then. First of all, talk to me a little bit about about finding housing and a place to stay. Yeah. That was something that uh, I heard before. Oops. Are you okay? Can you start again? I'm sorry. Are you, is he too close? Well, he's Yeah, okay, sitting back. Okay, okay go ahead. Yeah. yeah, yeah, all right, that's fine. Is it cut or No, no, we're going. Okay, that's, tell me about finining houses yeah. and how tough it was. Yeah, it was a, <clears throat> a problem. That's I heard before I left. That's what my daddy, I never will forget what he said. He. Uh, as I said, I used to always believe in doing, taking orders from him. So I'd went up to his house and told him that I planned to come to California. And uh, then when it got pretty close to the time I was fixing to leave, I was up there one day. <clears throat> and I talked with him a good while, and then I got ready to leave, and I walked out going down the hallway to, Leave and he followed me. He went to come along with me and something he hadn't been doing and he told me just before we got to the steps, says, What I want to say to you is I don't think you ought to go to California. And he'd been used to me doing what he said do. So uh, I don't remember what else was said, but I remember him saying that and I left and went on home, but I didn't change my plans no way. The day I had planned to leave, 
I left. And uh, I caught a bus there and uh, rode bus all the way into Berkeley. And tell me about finding housing. Huh? Yeah, yeah. And then when I got to Berkeley, <clears throat> what I planned to do was to find these two fellows that was at left home. And I was walking after I left the bus station on the streets, and I uh, met two or three, and I'd ask them, did they know these fellows, and they'd tell me no. So, and I remember the last person I met, the question about these fellows from home was a... Look at me. Yeah, there was a young black lady that uh, I stopped her and asked her, did she know him? She told me, no, she, she didn't. So and we left and walked on. Got maybe hardly half a block. And she stopped and turned around and called me. She said, did you, was you looking for a place to stay? And I thought I was going to find them, I remember. I started to tell her no, but I told her, well, yes, I could. She told me, she says, on up there, two blocks on the corner, and told me that house. She said, you... Okay, hang on for a second. We got... Mark. Take six. Uh, Mark, Mr. Van Hook, let's, let's start that story over. You, you, you're walking away from the woman, and tell me just when she calls you back. It's yeah. Like... Yeah, that is... Uh, that when I was needing a... Don't forget, look at me now. Yeah. Okay. A housing. I need the place to stay. And uh, she asked me, did I, is you want to find a place to stay? I told her, yeah. She told me how to go, where to go on up in the house to stop at. And I went <clears throat> right on there and I went in. And this was a senior lady. Her name was, they called her Mother Lily. So I went in and told her what I was there for, looking for a place to stay. And she told me, well, I ain't got but uh, this one room and this one man already that stays here, he's uh, just out of the penitentiary. And they had to find a place to stay before they would let him. And I let him come here. He's, he's in there. And if you wanted to, he going to stay one night. If you wanted to, you had to sleep with him tonight. He killed a man, and he's, and I never did forget that. I had to sleep with that type of person the first night I was in town. But he left the next day. And then I had that place there with Mother Lily. And I was thinking about it, I'll never forget. Yeah, after I went to work and wrote back home, the news got out, my address and everything. For the next, well, I sent and got my brother and another friend. But for the next two or three, trip from home, the guys would come there. And uh, that was on Carlton Street in Berkeley. But uh, <clears throat> as you spoke about the housing situations, the projects weren't finished. They were working on them in 1943. So they, would, they, they told us in the shipyards, as you are, uh, Get a blank here and fill it out and put in for your housing, but they tell you, you may not get one for six months or more. And uh, so I got a paper and filled it out for a house, or house I mean for a rental place. And it was just a blessing. It wasn't over three weeks. On my time card, when I got it that mo one morning, they had a little note on there, you got a apartment. 
on South 25th Street. And it was a three bedroom. So I went there and, and uh, was there for, oh, I wasn't there too long before there was some, I sent and got my brother and they was there with me. I never will forget the night I was working swing shift. And they come in while I was away from work and to show you what the difference is. Now then, you didn't have to lock your door and my door wasn't locked. When I come in from work, swing shift, I opened my door and went in, there was two guys laying up in my bed. My brother and so uh, <clears throat> I took them and they went to work and they were staying there with me and then there was two more couples come from home and they come there. They just crowded me out. So uh, when I sent and got my family, they come and uh, so then I had to, had to clear out all the others, you know. And kid, my wife, she got a job and we worked there. And then later on, I put in for a big apartment and uh, I got another apartment over on State Street that, that had uh, was it four bedrooms, I believe? Anyway, I moved from there over on State Street. And, uh, Tell me something. When, when you made trips home and spread the word, how, what did people think back in Arkansas of how you were doing? Oh, yeah. How did they react? There was this, and then that just triggered off the others coming. They just come to California then. And, uh, they would, uh, like I said, they would come to my apartment. They had my address, so I would help them go to the shipyard with them and then uh, try to help them find a place to stay, you know. And it was a big thrill to me to, to not to have to use that hammer and, working out and I got promoted to give the orders, you know. And uh, it was, I remember when that happened one night, I wasn't expecting it, but when you was at, on the job, there was a speaker, a loudspeaker, if there's anybody Working there, it had some happen or anything. They had to call them. They'd call your name, so they called my name on the loudspeaker. Louis Napoleon Van Hook, come to the office. There's some news for you. I didn't know what it was, so I took off and went on there, and uh, the little lady grabbed some sheet of paper and shelled them out there and says, fill that out, put your name and uh, fill that out there. Say, you've been promoted to a leader man. So I filled it out. So the next day, they, uh, I went to the yard and this is the superintendent, he carried me and showed me where to go and give me the list of the men that was going to be working under me. And from then on, that's what I did. I just, you know, give them orders. Did you ever think when you were back on the farm in Arkansas that all that would happen? No, I sure didn't. I wasn't expecting nothing like that. And that's it was quite a blessing. Like I say, I wasn't used to that kind of money. But this old man that loaned me that money, 
I paid him, sent him, mailed him his money. And, uh, well, when I first went back home was when I paid him. And I went and carried it to him, carried him. And uh, I remember my dad, he didn't, he told me, he says, you know, have to pay it all at once, maybe, but I just went on and paid it all. Now, you told me that, that later on, in fact, your dad, who had uh, thought it wasn't a great idea for you to come, that he came out himself. Yeah. Yeah. Tell he, me about that. Yeah. Well, he, he told me that day he didn't think I ought to come, but I, I, I come on. I didn't change my schedule at all. I come on, went to work, and then... Uh, I remember after I went back home and uh, my family was here, I stayed in touch with them. And uh, my mother wrote me a letter and told me that uh, they wanted to see us. We'd been away from home long enough and she would, they, they thought they ought to, we ought to come home. They wanted to see us. So I had a, I bought me a new pickup truck, and my brother had a 39 model Chevrolet. So we got together and decided we wanted to drive home, and uh, so we did. Me and his his kids were small, and mine, some of mine was. So we drove home and visited my dad and mother. And so uh, they did decide that they wanted to come back with us. So we, uh, they got in his car with him. And so we brought them back home here, brought them back here. He stayed with me first, and uh, I had an old friend of mine that I was bobbed in. I'd been cutting his hair. <clears throat> he come got his hair cut one day, and he asked me, says, uh, is all of your brothers? Take seven. Uh, Mr. Van Hook, Susan, would you just ask you before we started, um, tell me about, about when you had to join the union. What was that about? Yeah. <clears throat> Well, when I first went to work in the shipyard, they, there wasn't no union. They didn't have mention there. But I don't remember how long it was before this Boilermaker Union come in and we had to join it. And I don't remember what it cost and nothing like that. All I remember was the Boilermaker Union is what you had to get in from then on to get a job. I stayed with it after I left the shipyard. Stayed in the Union? Yeah. Now, we've heard that, that during that period that, that when a person like yourself joined the Boilermakers, you had to join what was called an auxiliary union, that you couldn't be part of the main union. Yes. I can slightly remember some of that, but there was some problems, all right, with that. But I can slightly remember that uh, it ended up, and we didn't, wasn't worried with it no more after they told us. Wouldn't be bothered with that problem no more. Well, some people were pretty upset about it. Some people yeah. didn't want to do that. Yeah, but, that's right. But you told me before that there was, that being here and having the job meant so much that that other stuff didn't matter. Is that oh, true? yeah, Did yeah. It? I'm telling you, after having a job and making the kind of money I was making, it was, and as I went to tell you about my dad, uh, this friend of mine asked me, was all my brothers working and all? told him, yeah. 
Well, I knew a place where I could get him a job, and so I thought about my dad. Told him about my dad, and he said, well, he told me where to bring him to. So he carried him to yard one, to the paint department. And uh, they gave him a job of just doing some clean work around the painting places. Good job for her. And so I just thought about not only surprised to get him here and then got him here and got him a job. He worked there and made, saved some money out of that. So was the job much more important than the union problems? Or? Well, uh, yes, you know, them union problems, you know, I remember, but I done forgot just what happened. I should never forget that. Well, it sounds like it wasn't as important as the other stuff. But... Yeah, it wasn't. Tell me something now. Tell me, uh, I know your family had been musical and your father had been a music teacher. Tell me how you how you started the group, the singing group. Singing group. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, uh, It's uh, me and my brother had, when we left home, had a quartet. So, uh, after he got here with me, me and him and one more young fellow from home, we started doing some singing at the apartment there. And we wound up <coughs> getting four voices, what we needed in a quartet. And we had a way of rehearsing probably nearly every night when we'd get together there. So being a barber and cutting hair too, there's always some guys coming in. So there was another fellow that come in and heard us sing and he he was a good singer. He joined in with us. And, uh... How, how did you choose that name? How did you become known as the yeah. Singing Shipyarders? Yeah, well, uh... This fella, I done forgot his name, too, but he was, uh... He was in the office that had the, the radio. And uh, he gave us that name. Were you all working at the yards? Yeah. Yeah, we was all working in the shipyards. And uh, the way we got started, on some nights in the shipyard, they would uh, take a hours, couple of hours for partying. And uh, I told some of them, there at the party one night that uh, I had a group of singers. So they told me, so hey, you bring them here and we want to hear them sing. So we got them there one night and they heard us sing. Yeah, that, and uh, that man was named J.P. Owens. He was the, uh, he was the uh, manager in the office for the radio. Your son was telling me that uh, that you'd sometimes be singing at the yards and people would stop what they're doing and st or even mm -hmm. stop fighting and come. Yeah, yeah. Tell me that story. Yeah, they, uh, I mean, when we were singing in the, in the yards, they, uh, usually when you'd get a crowd that way and they wasn't, wasn't working, they would, you know, get cross step maybe have a little misunderstanding fights but I guess them songs would have an effect on the feelings of them and uh, it was just peaceable they wasn't no trouble yeah they uh, so we uh, 
we needed a bass singer. I just said it was the good Lord. We needed a bass singer. And one night we were singing, and uh, this guy, I don't remember whether he come to get a haircut or why he was there, but he heard us. Go ahead. And he, uh, he come in and... Um, Mr. Van Hook, I got a sort of a general question about living through those times, the, through the Depression and, and those war years. What, what did you think about what Franklin Roosevelt had done for the country? What did you feel about him? Well, uh, yeah, I felt that he had... Would you say, I felt that Franklin Roosevelt, so we know who you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Is that good? Yeah. Yes, uh, being that far back, there's some things I can't remember, you know, good, but uh, I remember thinking well of him, what he did, the way he did. Yeah. When you look back at, at that period, do you look back at it as, as bad times or good times? How do you see it now? Yeah, when I look back at that, it, it was uh, some bad times. Yeah. But um, are, are there any good memories? When you think about the good things, what? what yeah. Yes. Uh, during them days, uh, it was uh, some good, some good days that we enjoyed. Did you did you did you ever regret that decision coming out to California? No, no, I didn't. I always called it a blessing. That's the way I felt about it ever since I left and came here. I felt that it was the way it, way it turned out. My dad didn't agree for it. And uh, <clears throat> after so long, he was come on out here himself and the whole family was here and been here ever since. And I just think it was just a blessing that led me and taught me into coming here. Did you ever have any friends that, that decided this wasn't for them and went back or did everyone stay? Well, I had some some that Went back way years later, but not, no. Not then? No. Okay, let's cut. Do you have any other questions? Lord, Van Hook Music, take one. And hang on for a second. Let's okay. Cut. okay, whenever you're ready. Okay. okay. <laughs>
Douglas Van Hook, uh, take 10, come and go with me. Really? Yeah, what's it about? Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Tell him that you saw me. 
next cut. Now, what would you? Marker. Van Hook, take 13, guitar duet. One second. Hang on. Let it get settled and I'll, I'll tell you what. Mm -hmm. Have him look this way too. Yeah, right? everybody's playing towards me. You're playing yeah, right, right over here. Yeah. Look, yeah. look at my fist. Oh, look at my... Okay. There we go. Okay, anytime. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. 